In collaboration with the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism at Yale, the Frankie program is delighted to have Ross Anderson, the deputy editor at the Atlantic Magazine. I would first like to start by recognizing our benefactors, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie, for their generosity in endowing this program that allows us to host these events. Ross Anderson was previously the senior editor where he was overseeing science and science, technology, and health at The Atlantic before he became the deputy editor. And prior to joining The Atlantic, he was the deputy editor of Eon Magazine, which was a fully online magazine that focused primarily on science. And um, Ross has written sort of fantastic articles on space sciences, cosmology, which is a key interest for him, as well as biology, and he has tackled the social implications of science and technology in many of the pieces that he's written. He's looked at a broad set of ideas, sharing not just the latest discoveries, but also emerging ideas in science and technology that continue to strongly shape our world. Science communication is something that he has been very passionate about. And in this age of rampant denialism of science, it's extremely important that we as scientists, as intellectuals, have in our corner fantastic writers like him who convey important discoveries, the content of these discoveries, but also the context of the work, and are able to make it accessible with real clarity. He studied at UC Irvine, where he majored in philosophy of science, and I believe this has uh, deeply shaped his ability as well as his desire to write at the intersection of science and the arts, and help bridge these unnecessary so-called two-culture divides. Uh, one of the nice things about um, Ross is that um, he actually delves very deeply into his stories. And I remember reading a story that he wrote about cosmology um, in which he immersed himself meeting cosmologists, reading scientific papers for almost six months before he uh, wrote that piece. So there's that kind of rigor. So he has the mind of a scientist with that kind of rigor and of course writes uh, beautifully, which not all of us scientists uh, can. And um, the reason I found him really quite charming when I first met him was that um, he said that one of the things that's been really, I'm, I'm quoting uh, uh, an interview that he gave, that one of the things that's been really refreshing in dealing with scientists as opposed to say politicians or most business people is that scientists are wonderfully candid. They're just firing on all cylinders all the time because they traffic in ideas and that's what's important to them. So you can see it was uh, very, very easy to be totally charmed when you know he's so fond of your community and what you do. So uh, before, we, uh, before I invite Ross to um, talk to us today where he's gonna talk to us about writing at the intersection of science and the arts, I just wanted to mention um, upcoming Frankie program events. Oh. Uh, Oddly enough, uh, we have another writer-focused um, writer event on Wednesday, this Wednesday, and we have the mathematician turned novelist, award-winning novelist, Zia Heather Rahman, uh, and we'll be having a conversation, again, on how the two cultures shape uh, imagination and creativity. And then as part of our Mapping and Knowing lecture series, uh, on March 31st, we have the musicologist Victor Coelho, who has been mapping the uh, musical traditions across time and space. And I just wanted to alert you to one event, which is uh, our distinguished lecturer event, which is on April 13th. We have Susan Hockfield, who was the uh, former provost of Yale and former president of MIT, who will be coming to speak to us. And I just wanted to remind you that we have this uh, video contest, Eureka, that is on, and uh, it's open, so please send in your entries to describe any scientific concept without using mathematics or jargon using a video under two minutes. Uh, so this is a contest that we have announced as part of the Frankie program. So without much further ado, um, I'd like to invite Ross to come and speak. All right. I hope to live up to that very generous introduction. Get my notes up here. Okay, um, I have to start uh, actually by apologizing for a bit of false advertising. Um, 
a day after I told Priya that we were going to call this talk Writing at the Intersection of, of Science and the Arts, um, I realized that that title was, was all wrong. Um, the good news is the actual substance of this talk is uh, Hughes much closer to um, the, uh, our, our generous hosts and their mission here, the Frankie program. Because uh, while I have done some writing about the touch points between science and the arts, um, I want to talk today about how we, uh, when we tell stories about science, how we situate science in sort of the, uh, the broader humanistic project. Um, we have to, uh, uh, and really the arts are part of that project, but they're only one part of it. Um, we have to work hard to tell stories in that way uh, because in the popular press, um, scientists, uh, science itself tends to be ghettoized. Um, Scientists are often depicted as these kind of like this nerdish, sexless, almost priestly class. Uh, when in reality, as we know, scientists are complex, flawed, fully realized human beings. Um, science is also depoliticized. And uh, I don't mean with respect to climate change or vaccines. I mean that science itself is political in the way that all human endeavors are political. Um, you get to know scientists, uh, not Priya, um, but you discover they're not all angelically pure moral truth seekers. Um, they, uh, they take part in feuds, they jockey for power in their respective fields, uh, and they have petty jealousies. Um, and more important than that, the knowledge that scientists produce isn't just nerdy trivia, um, nor is it strictly the means by which we get new technologies. Uh, science has implications for the way we even think about ourselves as human beings, um, situated in this grand cosmos. And I think that the, the, the humanities, the humanistic disciplines, um, art, literature, religion, and philosophy, and much else, ignore science at their peril. Uh, and so when we write about sciences uh, at the Atlantic in lots of places, um, we try to get to that whole spectrum from the human messiness all the way to kind of the grandeur of the cosmos. And I'm gonna to try to say something today about how we do that by stepping through a few long form essays that I've written, um, just to explain how I've thought about them um, and some of the choices I've made. And I'll make that concrete with some uh, short-ish readings. Um, I guess by now you should realize that you've done something very foolish in inviting a writer to talk about uh, his work. And to that point, I want to stress that there are really many ways to make science come alive and to situate science in the broader humanistic project. Uh, Carl Zimmer is in the audience with us today and is quite good at it himself. And I'm only talking about the way I do it because it's the way I know best. Um, also, you forgive me, I have no slides, uh, partly out of incompetence and partly because it makes me feel like a an old-fashioned man of, uh, of letters. Um, I want to start with an essay that I wrote back in 2012, uh, which I have a great deal of nostalgia for, uh, because it was the first long-form piece that I wrote for publication. And this essay was nominally about the James Webb Space Telescope, which will serve as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, provided that it ever launches. Um, back when I wrote this piece, the Webb, uh, which it uh, uh, as it's known, was already tremendously delayed, but everyone was uh, sort of confident that it would go up by 2018, and now Priya will know better than I do, but it, there's chatter that it might not even lift off before 2021. Um, but that actually gets a bit to why I wanted to write about the web. Um, when you want to do a science piece that folds in thinking from a lot of different disciplines, it kind of helps to have a subject that won't put you on deadline. Um, and I knew I wanted to write something sort of dreamy and philosophical about the future of astronomy. And um, the web was this perfect vehicle because it was futury, uh, obviously, since it has yet to launch. Um, but it, uh, it was just concrete enough that you could kind of give it the mouthfeel of reported journalism. Um, in thinking about how to do that, I realized fairly on that I didn't want to zoom too far into the, tech, the extraordinary technical capabilities of the telescope. Um, nor did I want to get uh, too far into the funding fights and delays, uh, despite what I said earlier about politics. Um, that had been really well handled in a famous piece by Lee Billings called 
the telescope that ate astronomy. Um, I was much more interested in situating the web in this grand narrative. And so instead of siloing the piece in the field of astronomy, I ended up positioning it as a sort of exciting new development in the grand history of human seeing, human vision. Um, and you can get a flavor of that uh, approach from the intro, which I'll read from now. It's been a while. Uh, the eye has long been thought the jewel of human anatomy. In Mesopotamia, fount of civilization and astronomy, Sumerians wor worshiped small gods of clay and marble, featureless but for the stare of large eyes. The ancient Egyptians had several different hieroglyphs for the eye. In his metaphysics, Aristotle called seeing the noblest faculty of man. Not even modernity has scrubbed the eye of its metaphysical sheen. James Russell Lowell dubbed it the notebook of the poet. And among the religious, its mere existence is said to refute Darwin. Yet for all of this tribute, the human eye remains a limited technology, seeing only the rainbow of visible light, a thin slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. And even this in this realm, it falls short of other mammals, for whom nightfall is no curfew. To have squinted into the dark and seen the glimmer of raccoon eyes is to have felt the chill of this truth. Hence, the human toolmakers had to compensate, and vigorously, first by pouring new light into the world with fire and electricity, and by dreaming up technologies to complement the eye. Like early stone tools, these began crudely, chips of crystal unearthed and shaped into small magnifiers. In Rome, Nero was said to have peered through an emerald at gladiators fighting in the distance. It would take until 1608 for the telescope to be invented, and another year still until one was pointed at the night sky. Light from the moons of Jupiter fell down that telescope and into the mind of Galileo, who deduced from it that not all heavenly bodies circled the Earth, the first in a series of fresh cosmologies wrought by the telescope. In the 19th century, William Herschel would use a large wooden telescope to find and catalog thousands of nebulae, single stars then thought to be surrounded by clouds of luminous fluid. A century later, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, Edwin Hubble took a closer look at Herschel's nebulae. He discovered that Herschel had been right in thinking that nebulae contained stars, but that he was seriously mistaken about the number. We now have a new word for nebulae, galaxies. The 400 years since Galileo have marked a revolution in seeing unlike anything since the Cambrian explosion when light sensitivity first rippled through the feed food chain, remaking it wholesale. In that time, the telescope has divided and grown, mutating from a single modest tube to a multitude of enormous landscape-dominating forms. It has assumed the ways of an ascetic, leaving civilization for more, more solitary, contemplative environments. Deserts, the shoulders of volcanoes, exotic islands, even space itself. The camera and the computer have given the telescope a memory, freeing it from constant attachment to the human eye. Most importantly, it has become a refined esthete, keen to the entire electromagnetic palette, including a species of energy especially prized by astronomers, infrared light. A telescope sensitive to infrared light can see into thick clouds where new stars and planets lurk. And in the chill of deep space, freed from the atmosphere's distorting shimmer, an infrared telescope can see nearly all of time. In writing that piece, one of the things I wanted to do was suggest that the achievements of the telescope, and specifically of the Hubble Space Telescope, were not yet appreciated by the humanities. Um, the more I sat with the, Hubble, the images that Hubble produced, the more I had the sense that their philosophical implications had only begun to be processed by the wider culture. At first, I wanted to make a straightforward argument to that effect, but everything that I tried to do just read too dull or abstract. So in the end, I tried uh, to show, not tell, um, by dwelling at some length on the, local, the total marvelousness of the Hubble Deep Field. All of you will have seen Deep Field images. This, this is my only slide, so <laughs> soak it up. Um, these are the ones where they point the Hubble at some tiny region of the sky uh, for a period of days. And it slowly collects these faint layers of light. And at the end, you get this really far-reaching cosmic vista. And my sense is that while images like these have been widely distributed, we're still kind of grappling with the awesome truths that they communicate, which I tried to get at here. Said, at first glance, one might mistake the deep field for gemstones scattered across black velvet. But a closer look reveals that each smudge of light, 2,600 in all, is a galaxy 
dense with billions of star-fired worlds, pinwheeling a deep time. Before the Hubble Deep Field, astronomy had imaged objects only four billion light years away, and poorly at that. Here, a telescope reached 11 billion light years into space and delivered a picture legible to the Laban, an unprecedented expansion of human vision. Much of the light caught by the deep field traveled to the Hubble from stars that burned out before the Earth had even begun to form. Gazing at it is like mainlining the whole of time through the optic nerve, like counting by fingertip the tree rings of the universe. From this progression, this cosmic vista, new notions about the evolution of stars and galaxies have emerged. Historically, discoveries of pure science are slow to reach the mainstream compared with those of the applied sciences, which noisily announce themselves with new medicines and gadgets. The Hubble has proved an exception, remaking in a single generation the popular conception of the universe. It has accomplished this primarily through the aesthetic force of its discoveries, which distill the difficult abstractions of astrophysics into the singular expressions of color and light. Though philosophy has hardly registered it, the Hubble has given us nothing less than an ontological awakening, a forceful reckoning with what is. It compels the mind to contemplate space and time on a, on a scale just shy of the infinite. And in only 400 years, it has transformed the night sky from a decorative ceiling, a fixed sphere of glittering stick figure gods, into a universe whose reaches carry the seeds of this earth and new earth still. This is one of the real privileges, uh, I think, of writing about the sciences, which is getting to frame its discoveries in a way that might pe make people think differently about the world they inhabit. Um, but not all uh, stories about science let you sit in that mode of pure wonder. Um, the next piece I want to talk about I did for a London-based magazine where I used to work, Aeon Magazine. Um, and it's called The Vanishing Groves, and it tells a much sadder story uh, about the bristlecone pines, the world's oldest trees. One of the things we talk a lot about at The Atlantic uh, is that we need to work really hard to tell conservation narratives in new and compelling ways. Um, you should all correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my sense that uh, the public has really become deadened uh, to hearing about sort of the endangered status of some beloved plant or animal. Um, they kind of know all the beats of those stories and all the tropes, and so there's a tendency for them to read really worthy. And yet, uh, alerting the public to the fact that you know, some of the most precious natural phenomena on Earth are endangered is some of the most vital work that we do as people who write about, sciences, about the sciences. And so it just takes uh, our full creative powers to sort of um, to do that in a way that feels surprising. Uh, I should admit, by the way, that when I first thought about writing about bristlecone pines, um, that was the full extent of my thinking, was just that uh, I'd like to write about bristlecone pines. Um, in the magazine business, we call that having a topic and not a story. Uh, but I want to say a brief, uh, put it a brief good word in for, uh, for topics, um, because I often find if you have time to develop them, um, that's sort of where you, you know, your inner curiosity is most engaged. And you know, with time, uh, you tend to find a story, sort of whether there's one there uh, at first glance or not. Um, with that said, please only ever pitch me uh, completely fleshed out stories. Um, anyway, I became obsessed with bristlecone pines for a while. Uh, a lot of the writing that I've done is about zooming out on long time scales. So a tree that lives up all by itself in uh, the high mountains um, and lives for 4,000 years was just very much my jam. Um, Shortly after I started reading up on the bristle cones, I, worried, or I, I learned that they were imperiled by climate change uh, because a warmer climate, uh, like many kinds of pine trees, brings bark beetles up to higher altitudes where the bristle cones previously had, um, had the ground to themselves. At that point, I already had this sense that climate change threatening the world's oldest trees was a pretty compelling narrative on its own. But I wanted to bring in some other threads that made this more distinctive. Um, what really clicked into place for me was when I figured out that, or I didn't figure it out, when I, I learned quite late, uh, that bristle cones are used in dendrochronology, which is the science of tree rings, which is actually how we get many of our kind of baseline climate records. Uh, I knew I could make those two things kind of talk to each other in a way that would let me riff on the still new idea of the Anthropocene, um, and that I'd kind of slowly discover it in the writing. Uh, in the end, that get, and this gets very much 
to the science, to science and the humanities, I position the, this loss of these trees as a loss of cultural memory. Here's how I tried to frame that in the intro of the piece. It said, no event, however momentous, leaves an everlasting imprint on the world. Take the cosmic microwave background, the faint electromagnetic afterglow of the Big Bang. It hangs reassuringly in every corner of our skies, the firmest evidence we have for the giant explosion that created our universe. But it won't be there forever. In a trillion years' time, it's going to slip beyond the cosmic light horizon, the outer edge of the observable universe. The universe's expansion will have stretched its wavelength so wide that it will be undetectable to any observer anywhere. Time will have erased its own beginning. On Earth, the past is even quicker to vanish. To study geology is to be astonished at how hastily time reorders our planet's surface, filling its craters, smoothing its mountains, and covering its continents in seawater. <clears throat> Life is often the fastest to disintegrate in this constant churn of water and rock. The speed of biological decomposition ensures that only the most geologically fortunate of organisms freeze into stone and become fossils. The rest dissolve into sediment, leaving the thinnest of molecular traces behind. Part of what separates humans from nature is our striving to preserve the past, but we too have proved adept at its erasure. It was humans, after all, who set fire to the ancient library of Alexandria, whose hundreds of thousands of scrolls contained a sizable fraction of classical learning. The loss of knowledge at Alexandria was said to be so profound that it set Western civilization back 1,000 years. Some have even described the library's burning as an event horizon, a boundary in time across which information cannot flow. The burning of books and libraries has perhaps fallen out of fashion, but if you look closely, you will find its spirit survives in another distinctly human activity, one as old as civilization itself, the destruction of forests. Trees and forests are repositories of time. To destroy them is to destroy an irreplaceable record of the Earth's past. Over the last century of unprecedented deforestation, a tiny cadre of scientists has roamed the world's remaining woodlands, searching for trees with long memories, trees that promise science a new window into antiquity. To find a tree's memories, you have to look past its leaves and even its bark. You have to go deep into its trunk, where the chronicles of its long life lie, secreted away like a library's lost scrolls. This spring, I journeyed to the high, dry mountains of California to visit an ancient forest, a place as dense with history as Alexandria, a place where the heat of a dangerous fire is starting to rise. A lot of this bristlecone piece um, covers the intricacies of these extraordinary organisms, the little kind of biological technologies that allow them to live and thrive for so long. But, and this gets to bringing the uh, humanities to bear on the sciences, I also tried to bring different modes of perception to bear on these trees and on forests more broadly. This is something that's become a bit of a theme in my work, so much so that I, I fear it's kind of verging on a shtick. Um, but whenever I write about phenomena in nature, I try to resurrect the pre-scientific view of the phenomena to try to give a larger sense of how the human mind has interacted with things like trees or stars or elephants or whatever uh, across time. That way, when we try to say what these things mean to us today, um, we're not pretending that we started with a blank cultural state, uh, slate. We're consciously in dialogue with the meanings these phenomena previously had in human culture. So for instance, when I take the reader on a hike through a remote bristlecone forest, I make sure to pause uh, to go into the following digression. This experience of openness and sublimity among the bristlecones is at odds with fundamental Western ideas about forests, ideas that might have something to do with our, particular, our peculiar animosity towards them. Indeed, a suspicion of forests as dark, shadowy places is written into the basic texts of Western culture. In Greek mythology, Dionysus, the ivory-wreathed god of the wooded glens threatens civilization with a return to animalistic primitivism. In the Old Testament, Yahweh commands Hebrews to burn down sacred groves wherever they find them. Christian culture has traditionally identified the forest as a pagan stronghold, a gloomy haven for witches and outlaws. In Dante, the forest is demon-haunted and evil. It's the underworld out of which the hero must ascend. For Descartes, the forest is the precursor to the Enlightenment, the physical embodiment of confusion, the maze that light beams of reason must penetrate. The Stanford literary critic, 
Robert Poe Harrison, suggests that at a, con a subconscious level, we resent forests for their antiquity, their antecedents to humans. Harrison traces the human dread of forests to the origin myths of sky gods like Jove, who first announced his existence to humans by sending lightning into primeval forests. He did this to clear a hole in the tree canopy, to open up the mute closure of foliage, as he put it, so that humans could see the sky for what it was, a divine entity, a sender of signs, a source of revelation about our origins and our destiny. Wherever divinity has been identified with the sky, or with the eternal geometry of the stars, or with cosmic infinity, or with heaven, forests become monstrous because they hide the prospect of God. I was grateful uh, that that bristlecone story got me thinking uh, in a mythic way about climate change. Um, because in early 2016, I had, after I'd moved to the Atlantic, I once again had the uh, tall order of making a climate change story compelling for readers. Um, by the way, that sentiment about climate change stories being uh, sort of boring for readers is starting to look a little outdated. One of the most kind of encouraging media trends that I've had the privilege to watch up close is the real genuine uptick in reader interest in climate stories, uh, which is encouraging. Um, used to be more of a sort of eat your vegetables reading. Um, also, if you will indulge me a plug, um, people often think of The Atlantic as kind of a strictly political magazine. And uh, to some extent, that's right. I mean, we were founded as a magazine of abolition, and we've uh, continued to make politics a central editorial interest. But of course, science can't be quarantined from politics. And when you look back in our archives, you'll see that science has been a preoccupation from our earliest years. Uh, I, Asa Gray published the first full-throated American defense of Darwinism in the pages of The Atlantic. Uh, John Muir famously made the case for the national parks um, in The Atlantic. And so when we write about sciences in the magazine, we try to take part in that rich lineage actually had uh, John Muir front of mind when I took on this climate-related story I'm going to tell you about, uh, which is about a place called Pleistocene Park, um, which is like a national park, uh, but with its ambitions turned up to 11. Um, Pleistocene Park is actually a, a, a geoengineering scheme cooked up by Russian father-son scientists who are trying to transform the Siberian high Arctic by, among other things, resurrecting woolly mammoths. Just in that sentence, um, you can tell there's a lot going on, which raises, raised one of the kind of fundamental difficulties of writing this piece, which was weaving all the explanatory work into the narrative of a first-person visit to Siberia uh, without losing propulsion. Um, I started the piece kind of in scene with me riding along uh, with one of the Russian scientists in this like tank-like all-terrain vehicle. Um, at which point he started uh, crashing directly into trees to knock them down. Uh, so sort of a good place to introduce the reader into the narrative. Um, but I knew to make this an Atlantic story, uh, I had to quickly pivot to the larger climate stakes. And also, uh, getting back to that theme of deep time, put the reader in a more expansive headspace. Um, so here's how I tried to do that. Human history began in the Pleistocene. Many behaviors that distinguish us from other species emerged during that 2.6 million year epoch, when glaciers pulsed down from the North Pole at regular intervals. In the flood myths of Noah and Gilgamesh, and in Plato's story of Atlantis, <clears throat> we get a clue as to what it was like when the last glaciation ended, and the ice melted, and the seas welled up, swallowing coasts and islands. But human culture has preserved no memory of an oncoming glaciation. We can only imagine what it was like to watch millennia of snow pile up into ice slabs that pushed ever southward. In the epic poems that compress generations of experience, a glaciation would have seemed like a tsunami of ice rolling down from the great white north. One of these 10,000 year winters may have inspired our domestication of fire, that still unequaled technological leap that warmed us, warded away predators, and cooked the calorie dense meals that nourished our growing brains. On our watch, fire evolved quickly, from a bonfire at the center of camp to industrial combustion that powers cities whose glow can be seen from space. But these latter fossil-fueled fires give off an exhaust, one that is pooling invisibly in the thin shell of air around our planet, warming its surface, and nowhere is warming faster or with greater consequence than the Arctic. 
Every Arctic winter is an ice age in miniature. In late September, the sky darkens and the ice sheet atop the North Pole expands, spreading a surface freeze across the seas of the Arctic Ocean, like a cataract dilating over a blue iris. In October, the freeze hits Siberia's north coast and continues into the land, sandwiching the soil between surface snowpack and subterranean frost. When the spring sun comes, it melts the snow, but the frozen underground layer remains. Nearly a mile thick in some places, this Siberian permafrost extends south through the tender, tundra moonscape and well into the taiga forest that stretches like an evergreen stripe across Eurasia's midsection. Similar frozen layers lie beneath the surface in Alaska and the Yukon, and all are now beginning to thaw. Pleistocene Park is meant to slow the thawing of the permafrost. For decades, the Zimovs and their animals have stripped away the region's dark trees and shrubs to make way for grasslands. Research suggests that these grasslands will reflect more sunlight than the forests and scrub they replace, causing the Arctic to absorb less heat. In winter, the short grass and animal trampled snow will offer scant insulation so that the season's freeze can reach deeper into the Earth's crust, cooling the frozen soil beneath and locking one of the world's most dangerous carbon dioxide loads into a thermodynamic vault. To test these landscape cooling effects, Nikita will need to import the large herbivores of the Pleistocene. He's already begun bringing them in from far off lands, two by two, as though filling an ark. But to grow his Ice Age lawn into a biome that stretches across continents, he needs millions more. He needs wild horses, musk oxen, reindeer, bison, and predators to corral the herbivores into herds. And to keep the trees beaten back, he needs hundreds of thousands of resurrected woolly mammoths. So I try not to tell readers what to think, um, but one of the first thoughts you should have upon hearing or reading that passage is, that's crazy. Um, and will that ever work? And that's a good question, and it's a question that is the proper domain of science journalism, and one uh, that I tackle at some length in this piece. But to me, um, I, I guess like the more time I spent in Siberia and sort of turning this over in my head, uh, Pleistocene Park became much more interesting as a cultural project. Um, like a lot of people, I have this sense that even in our post-enlightenment age, uh, humans are going to continue to embed, embed themselves in kind of grand scale mythic narratives. And as a writer, I'm really on the lookout for emergent ones. And in this case, the scientists had this view, which is still contested, um, but kind of slowly hardening into consensus, I'd say, uh, that this Arctic biome, and uh, along with much of the planet, had been utterly transformed after humans rampaged across the planet and killed most of the megafauna that live upon it. So um, to recap, you have this father and son in this far off landscape. They're trying to save the world by re resurrect resurrecting the most charismatic of the extinct charismatic megafauna. To me, that was just so obviously a mythic story. Um, and so I stopped seeing the resurrection of the mammoth as just like a necessary step in the climate science mitigation si project and instead saw it as a, an attempt at redemption at a time when we're kind of renegotiating our relationship to nature. Uh, I found that sort of so haunting and poignant that I, I tried to get that across in the closing of the piece, which I'll read now. It said, before I left to catch a plane back to civilization, I stood with Sergei on the mountaintop once more, taking in the view. He had slipped into one of his reveries about grasslands full of animals. He seemed to be suffering from a form of solastalgia a condition described by the philosopher Glenn Albrecht as a kind of existential grief for a vanished landscape, be it a swallowed coast, a field turned to desert, or a bygone geological epoch. He kept returning to the idea that the wild planet had been interrupted midway through its grand experiment, its 4.5 billion year blending of rock, water, and sunlight. He seemed to think that the Earth peaked during the Ice Age with the grassland ecologies that spawned human beings. He wanted to restore the biosphere to that creative summit so it can run its cosmic experiment forward in time. He wants to know what new wonders will emerge. Maybe there will be more than one animal with a mind, he told me. I don't know whether Nikita can make his father's mad vision a material reality. The known challenges are immense and there are likely many more he cannot foresee. But in this brave new age when it is humans who make and remake the world, it is a comfort to know that people are trying to summon whole landscapes 
Lazarus-like, from the tomb. Come forth, they are saying to woolly mammoths. Come into this habitat that has been prepared for you. Join the wolves and the reindeers and the reindeer and the bison who survived you. Slip into your old Ice Age ecology. Wander free in this wild stretch of the earth. Your kind will go stronger as the centuries pass. This place will overflow with life once again. Our original sin will be wiped clean. And if in doing all this, we save our planet and ourselves, that will be the stuff of a new mythology. I'm conscious that I've been doing sort of a lot of reading at you um, this afternoon. And so, and I wanna save time uh, for questions. But before I close, I wanna talk about my most recent Atlantic feature. Um, I say most recent, uh, but actually I mean most recent, uh, most recently published. Um, I'm working on another one right now that I'm just entering closing on, which means I uh, don't want to talk about it all, and in fact hope to not talk about it for another year. Um, so this piece I published last year, um, and it's called A Journey into the Animal Mind, and it's about animal consciousness, a subject that I'd been hoping to write about for some time. And I started it by, pre uh, by casting a pretty wide net, trying to sort of gather up as many sort of sparkly animal cognition studies and anecdotes that I could find in order to build a sweeping case that it was time to reconsider the question of whether animals have an inner life. I found that process really satisfying, uh, research being the best part of writing, because you don't have to write. Um, but as I started to think through possible structures and writing approaches for this piece, every way that I imagined doing it seemed really conventional. Um, for instance, I thought of doing that sort of lab to lab thing. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, I'm at the dolphin lab, you know, or I'm at the primate lab, and you know, lo and behold, all these, these creatures are so smart. Um, but my sense was that I'd be sort of frog marching readers through a structure like that, and that, um, you know, uh, one of the healthy disciplines of working at a general interest magazine, as opposed to a, like somewhere like Scientific American, that where, you know, there's sort of an assumed interest on the part of the reader uh, that science is interesting, is that, um, you know, my readers can like flip to the next feature, which might be a, a, a true crime yarn or uh, a piece by my colleague Graham Wood, who's in the back of the auditorium, I'm delighted to embarrass. Um, <clears throat> and so, we really have to work to sort of keep, keep reader interest. Um, in my experience, when you're stuck on your approach to a story, it's sort of the best thing you can do is keep reading. Um, but in a, in a, at least for me, it's a, a sort of specific kind of reading, which is, a, a, I think of it as kind of a widening of the intellectual lens. And being someone who's interested in the history of ideas, uh, in this case, I did <clears throat> that, um, I did that extra reading more about the history of thinking about animal consciousness. And in doing so, I started to learn about Jainism, uh, an ancient religion on the Indian subcontinent, um, among other places, uh, whose practitioners had been sounding the alarm about animal consciousness and its implications for human moral life for some 3,000 years. Um, when I hit upon that, it gave me the idea that uh, if my editor did not think it was completely insane, I can nest all this sort of cutting edge uh, scientific research inside the first person experience of a Jain pilgrimage in India. Um, here's how I, uh, it's a difficult thing to communicate, I can, I can confide, it's a difficult thing to communicate to the reader in the introduction of a piece that this is what's going to happen, so here's what we tried to do that. <clears throat> so no aspect of our world is as mysterious as consciousness, a state of awareness that animates our every waking moment. The sense of being located in a body that exists within a larger world of color, sound, and touch, all filtered through thought and imbued by emotion. Even in a secular age, consciousness re retains a mysterious veneer, it is alternatively described as the last frontier of science and a kind of immaterial magic beyond science's reckoning. David Chalmers, one of the world's most respected philosophers on the subject, once told me that consciousness could be a fundamental feature of the universe like space-time or energy. He said it might be tied to the diaphanous, indeterminate workings of the quantum world, or something non-physical altogether. These metaphysical accounts are in play because scientists have yet to furnish a satisfactory explanation of consciousness. We know the body's sensory systems beam information about the external world into our brain, where it's processed sequentially by increasingly sophisticated neural layers. But we don't know how those signals are integrated into a smooth, continuous world picture 
a flow of moments experienced by a roving locus of attention, a witness, as Hindu philosophers call it. In the West, consciousness was long thought to be a divine gift bestowed solely on humans. Western philosophers historically conceived of non-human animals as unfeeling automatons. Even after Darwin demonstrated our kinship with animals, many scientists believed that the evolution of consciousness was a recent event. They thought the first mind sparked awake sometime after we split from chimps and bonobos. In his 1976 book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, Julian Jaynes argued that it was later still. He said the development of language led us, like Virgil, into the deep cognitive states capable of constructing experiential worlds. Now, each year brings a raft of new research papers, which, taken together, suggest that a great many animals might be conscious. It was likely more than a half billion years ago that some seafloor arms race between predator and prey roused Earth's first conscious animal. That moment, when the first mind winked into being, was a cosmic event, opening up possibilities not previously contained in nature. There now appears to exist, along alongside the human world, a whole universe of vivid animal experience. Scientists deserve credit for illuminating if only partially, this new dimension of our reality. But they can't tell us how to do right by the trillions of minds with which we share the Earth's surface. That's a philosophical problem. And like most philosophical problems, it will be with us for a long time to come. Apart from Pythagoras and a few others, ancient Western philosophers did not hand down a rich tradition of thinking about animal consciousness. But Eastern thinkers have long been haunted by its implications, especially the Jains who have taken animal consciousness seriously as a moral matter for nearly 3,000 years, as perhaps the world's first culture to extend mercy to animals. The Jains pioneered a profound expansion of the human moral imagination. The places where they worship and tend to animals seem to me like good places to contemplate the current frontier of animal consciousness research. Now, all along when I was imagining how to structure this piece, even when I was thinking about going lab to lab, I thought that I would go from sort of like start as close to humans on the tree of life as possible and kind of go further and further away. So from uh, mammals or primates, you know, onto birds and then fish and then ultimately ending in insects where I think the, that's as far as, as pretty as like remote as you can get um, from humans on the tree of life and still have some, some compelling evidence of an inner life. Um, but uh, I had to now think about how to do that in India. Um, and like to weave it together with the Jane. So I had to like go have Jane experiences that would bring me into like some animal encounters that could, you know, with some writing trickery, like uh, be made to serve this larger argument. And I really wanted as part of this to go see the Asiatic lions, uh, which are a really rare big cat species. There's um, less than 600 of them in the world. Not, some people don't know there's uh, lions in India, um, in Gujarat actually. And so I went, um, I went to see them. They also were very useful for my purposes because they play a role in Jain mythology. And I went to see them, had this like great time a couple days in Gujarat. Like I went out with like the head of the forestry department, like in the Jeep in the back country, going hunting lions. And uh, I got back and just like that wrote the hell out of that section of the piece, like to the tune of like sort of four or five thousand words. And I turned it in my editor along with the larger piece, and he's like, Yeah, uh, you know, people know cats are conscious. We live with them. It's just kind of obvious. It's not that surprising. I think you just cut the whole lion section, <laughs> and, uh, which was uh, extremely, extremely distra uh, distressing, um, but also unimpeachable in its logic. Um, we had this kind of long bargaining phase where I uh, kept sort of being like, well, you know, what if we cut it down to like 2,000 words, you know, and, and kept trying to like show him permutations of that section that could possibly be included. But um, alas, the final cut uh, did, did not contain it. Um, I, uh, I still have the line section of my personal file, so I'm now going to read, just kidding. Um, uh, no, I, I want to read a, uh, a short passage about fish um, from one of the sections that did survive my editor's uh, in interventions, just to give you a sense of how I tried to weave together the, um, the scientific material with the Jainism. Uh, for context, at this point in the piece, I've just sort of finish making the point that the experience of pain, which is a conscious experience, is something more than the detection of damage, um, which is something that even bacteria do. I say fish have many more kinds of damage sensors than bacteria do. 
Their sensors flare when the water temperature spikes, when they come into contact with corrosive chemicals, when a hook rips through their scales and into their flesh. In the lab, when trout lips are injected with acid, the fish do not merely respond at the sight. They rock their entire bodies back and forth, hyperventilating, rubbing their mass against the cool glass of their tanks, a behavior that ceases when the fish are giving morphine. The experiences of these lab fish are grim and possibly unethical, but they're nothing compared with those endured by the trillions of aquatic animals that humans yank unceremoniously out of oceans and rivers and lakes every year. Some of those fish are still alive hours later when they're shoveled into the sickly lit refrigerated intake tubes of the global seafood supply chain. Fish pain is, of course, something different from our own pain. In the elaborate mirrored hall that is human consciousness, pain takes on existential dimensions. Because we know that death looms and grieve for the loss of richly imagined futures, it's tempting to imagine our pain as the most profound of all suffering. But we would do well to remember that our perspective can make our pains easier to bear, if only by giving it an expiration date. When we pull a less cognitively blessed fish up from the pressured depths and barometric trauma fills its bloodstream with tissue-burning acid, its on-deck thrashing might be a silent scream, born of the fish's belief that it has entered a permanent state of extreme suffering. The Jains tell a story about a man from deep antiquity who is said to have been sensitive to the distress calls of other animals. His name is Nemanoth, and he is said to have developed this unusual fondness for animals while tending cattle on the banks of the Yamuna River in his home village of Sharipur, which I reached four hours after leaving Delhi. Nemanoth is one of 24 Jane Ford makers, prophet-like figures whose life stories tend to emphasize their nonviolent natures. One is said to have floated perfectly still in the womb, sending not so much as a ripple through the amniotic fluid to avoid harming his mother. The Jains say Nemanoth left Sharipur for good on the day of his wedding. That morning he mounted an elephant, intent on riding it to the temple where he was to be wed. On the way, he heard a series of agonized screams and demanded to know their origin. Nemanoth's elephant guide, <clears throat> a man who had reason to know something about animal consciousness, explained that the screams came from animals that were being slaughtered for his wedding feast. This moment transformed Nemanoth. Some versions of the story say he freed the surviving animals, including a fish that he carried in his hands back to the river. Others say he fled. All agree that he renounced his former life. Rather than marry his bride, he set out for Garnar, a sacred mountain in Gujarat, Gujarat, 40 miles from the Arabian Sea. So the final section of this piece, um, and of this talk, uh, follows my own ascent up this sacred mountain in Gujarat, where I encounter a wasp, and after some riffing about its likely cognitive capacities, climb up uh, to the top to take part in a Jain ritual. Um, I want to close the talk with a passage from it because it's a place where I really tried uh, my hardest, uh, you can tell me, I, I, I'm not sure I succeeded, but um, to achieve that synthesis that I talked about earlier, um, that sense of sort of situating a uh, scientific idea in the broader humanistic project. And I say that because the key thing to me about this story was that the, that the science was being put in service of larger questions, questions posed by the humanities um, that are actually prior to science in a really important uh, sense. And so in the end, it was fitting that the scientific aspects of the story were subordinate in the storytelling to the philosophical and even mythic aspects of it, which are all about human meaning. Here's how it ends. When the monk arrived at the wall where I was resting, the wasp flew away, rising up towards the sun until I lost it in the light. The monk was wearing a white mask, like those that some Janes wear, to avoid inhaling insects and other tiny creatures. I nodded to him as he passed and lay back against the warm stone of the mountain. The monk was a white dot, some, switchback, some six switchbacks up by the time I hopped off the wall and continued the climb, my legs stiffened by the break. I reached the entrance to the temple complex with only 15 minutes to spare. Its marble courtyard shone brilliant white as though bleached by the mountain sun. Ducking under a row of elegant golden medallions, I entered the temple's interior chamber, where dozens of candles flickered in intricately carved wall niches and on platforms that hung from the ceiling on chains. The stone ceiling was carved into a lotus flower, its delicate unfurling petals symbolizing the emergence 
of a pure ethereal soul from the earth's muddy materials. Forty Janes were sitting on the floor in neat rows, their legs crossed in the lotus position. The women wore fresh saris they carried up the mountain for the occasion. The men were dressed in all white. I wedged into a spot in the back. We faced a dark tunnel-like space lined by two sets of columns. At the far end, candlelight illuminated a black marble statue of a seated male figure. Its barrel chest was inlaid with gemstones, as were its eyes, which appeared to float serenely in the dark, inducing a hypnotic effect, broken only when the man sitting next to me tugged my shirt. Nemanoth, he said, nodding towards the statue. It was here on this mountain that Nemanoth is said to have achieved a state of total unimpeded consciousness, with perceptual access to the entire universe, including every kind of animal mind. Jains believe that humans are special because in our natural state, we are nearest to this experience of enlightenment. Among Earth's creatures, no other finds it so easy to see into the consciousness of a fellow being. The pilgrim started singing, first in a low hum and then steadily louder. One wheeled a giant drum next to the tunnel's entrance and struck it with a dark mallet. Two others bashed cymbals together. Men and women walked in from opposite doors, converging in two lines on either side of the tunnel. A woman wearing an orange sari and a gold crown crossed in, of, crossed in front of Nemanoth, listed, lifted a vessel over his black marble head and poured out a mixture of milk and blessed water. When she finished, a white robed man from the other line did the same. The singing grew louder until it verged on the ecstatic. The pilgrims raised their arms and clapped overhead, faster and faster. A climax seemed to loom, but then it all dropped away. The drums and the bells and the cymbals went quiet leaving a clear sonic space that was filled by a final blow on a conch. The shell's low note was long and clean. It rang out of the temple and over the ancient peaks. As it trailed off, I wondered whether, in the centuries to come, this place might become something more than a Jain house of worship. Maybe it will become a place to mark a moment in human history, when we awaken from the long dream that we are the only minds that nature has brought into being. Maybe people will come here from all corners of the earth to pay their respects to Nemanoth, who is, after all, only a stand-in for whoever it was who first heard animal screams and understood their meaning. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Happy to take questions. Looks like there's, looks like there's, Ty is holding a roving uh, microphone right there. Thank you so much, Gus, for a wonderful Oh. Oh, mine is just very quick. From the very first moment you started talking about the Hubble oh. and what could be seen into the far, far many eons ago mm. until the ending when you talked about the first recollection or understanding of the conscious mind through all the eons. Mm. What brought to mind was Jung and the collective unconscious mm. for some reason, so mm. I just throw it out there. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, uh, uh, I don't know what to say except that I, I too think Jung is really interesting and um, that uh, he obviously was engaged much deeper in that practice of thinking about how uh, phenomena in nature uh, are sort of interpreted by the mind and interpreted historically by many different cultures and I find that sort of endlessly fascinating. So I, I share your interest. Hi. Uh, you talked about uh, how you're concerned with the philosophical implications of mm. science and scientific discoveries uh, in society and how you would like to encourage your reader to grapple with the awesome truths and forceful reckoning that comes along with that without trying to tell them what to think. Mm. And um, you talked about introducing different modes of perception mm. and that makes me think about how a lot of what, what I read and what I hear talking about um, sort of ancient and indigenous and spiritual mm. concepts that Western science is mm. now starting to put language to. Mm -hmm. And I see what you're writing is, is kind of a creative mar marrying marriage of that. Mm. And so my question is, do you see uh, science and spirituality as kind of two sides of the same coin? Mm. Uh, whew. Um, that's a tough one that I will plead ignorant. No, um, I'm not sure that I can answer entirely. Uh, I'm not, uh, I think, I, w I guess I would be very boring and say that, you know, spirituality sort of means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
Um, I think that uh, there's certainly some spiritual relations to sort of human life on this planet that uh, are not only compatible, but uh, would sort of clear quite significant space for science and its kind of truth-seeking apparatus to inform um, their engagement uh, with human life on this planet. And so um, I certainly don't think they're opposed. Uh, and I find spirituality is, uh, for my purposes, uh, like when it comes to this piece on Jainism or some of the stuff around deforestation, is often just like a really good distillation of some of the most interesting philosophical thinking that was taking place two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 years ago. Um, and so I think it's like just a fascinating place to kind of mine the intellectual history of people's uh, approaches to some of these issues. Your, your subjects as a writer seem so varied. I'm wondering mm. if you perceive an underlying theme or commonality to the stories you've tackled that something that made you say at the time, this is my kind of story. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, Deep Time is definitely sort of one that kind of shows up in almost everything I write. Um, I'm really interested in kind of intellectual blank spots on the map, the unknown. So like, you know, when it comes to the far reaches of cosmology, um, life or, or intelligence elsewhere in the galaxy is really interesting. Um, uh, you know, uh, what we can know about other animal minds, which, you know, to a large extent will always be to some degree fundamentally mysterious. I mean, it's, I don't know what's happening in your mind. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'd say the unknown has a really kind of powerful pull for me. It's a good question. Carl. Um, so I was wondering, um, sort of combining your experiences as a writer mm -hmm. and also as an editor, mm -hmm. uh, and also when you're talking about having to just throw out 4,000 words about lions, um, I feel your pain. Yeah. And, I wonder, <laughs> and I'm wondering, I mean, there's been such a pressure a long-term pressure, like I'd say, over the past 20 years in terms of the s size and scope of stories. Mm. You know, like, can we make this shorter? Yeah. Shorter, 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 shorter. Um, <laughs> and, like, everything you're talking about is, it has to be big. So yeah. how, what's your, do you feel like readers of The Atlantic and other things still can, can sustain that attention in this environment? Or what, what's your view on big stories? Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I, so, like if you look at um, every year chart beat, I, I really hate to go into sort of um, the kind of grim intricacies of the media business here, this talk about cosmology and so forth. But um, uh, every year chart beat puts out a list of the most engaging stories of the year. And I'll do a brag for the home team that we've had three, uh, three of the last five years, the most engaging story has been an Atlantic story. And every one of them has been a long form story. One of them was actually written by Barris Graham again was written by Graham, uh, who's in the back. And uh, I, you know, I think there was this weird, not to get too nuanced on it, but there was a kind of um, a rediscovery of long form by the internet that happened maybe around, what, 2011, 2012, where everyone sort of got precious about it. Um, and you know, it was like, oh, long reads and long form. And was, were tried to really cram a lot of stories that maybe didn't deserve that treatment into that form. And so you ended up with like a lot of kind of pretty dry um, sort of kind of play acting long form. Um, maybe that's how you all felt, uh, felt during my long readings, by the way. Um, and then uh, I, uh, I think there's now been a correction back where, you know, partly due to some sort of <laughs> factors around scarcity in the media business in general, there are just fewer of, uh, of these kind of slots for super long stories um, that have this comprehensive approach, which is on one hand unfortunate, on the other hand is producing what's maybe a beneficial selection effect. Um, but uh, I guess the jury's out on that question. But look, I, I wish, I mean, there was a, that, that time sort of seven, eight years ago when you had lots of startup digital magazines that were doing tons of long form like Aeon. Uh, I mean, they're still undark and, and um, Nautilus, I guess, is kind of alive and maybe, I don't know. Um, there, it seems like there's still, uh, there's still a few of them, but it did seem like it was a time of, of real kind of creative profusion around long form that's kind of dwindled a little, for better or worse. Hi. Um, so it seems like historically the orientation or the, the relationship between journalism and science has, hmm. journalism has traditionally taken a celebratory um, mm -hmm. 
you know, stance towards, towards journalism. As you noted, um, of course, mm. science is political. We mm. pay, pay money to study one thing and not the other. Um, there's plenty of infighting. Um, I, I'm curious to hear how you think, or how, how, mm. how I guess, the Atlantic or um, your work experience mm. approaches the need or the question of how much critical science journalism there should be, mm. um, whether, the, whether the institution actually has the capacity to do enough of it, um, mm. given what people are interested in and all the wonders story. I mean, the, the universe is amazing. There are yeah. so many wonderful things to write about. Um, and so how, how you balance, how you think about balancing um, that mm. need for more kind of journalism that would reflect almost like a political journalism? Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Um, we certainly don't think about it in terms of like a pie graph, you know, like, oh, 30% investigative, you know, stories to point out scientists being bad. Um, uh, some of that, but we are kind of principally a magazine of ideas. Um, so our, you know, we recently ran a, um, a story last year about the end Cretaceous extinction and sort of the a, a long running scientific feud at the heart of that, that got a little bit into the politics of science, but through a larger narrative that was about big ideas, and that's kind of the vector that The Atlantic is usually gonna go in on when we do something about science at feature length. Fortunately, our media is still um, uh, robust enough that there are other outlets who kind of special, like, uh, look, the BuzzFeed Science Desk, um, we can't say enough good things about them as to, uh, in terms of calling to account kind of both sexual harassment and, and um, uh, malfeasance of any number of kinds uh, in the scientific community. It's not the first role of the Atlantic. Um, but I think it's more that when we tell deep stories about science, we want to have that kind of human and political uh, texture kind of throughout the piece, if that makes sense. Um, I guess I just wanted to say thanks to Ross and also mm. remind you all that he recently wrote this really beautiful piece about Kobe Bryant and sort of the mixed legacy. Um, so I really recommend that piece. So thank you so much, Ross, for this you, uh, wonderful session. Mm. And I invite you all to the reception. Thank you very much. Yes. Mm. Mm.